Hello everybody, Mr. Eck here. Today we're going to talk about verifying identities using the double angle formulas. And we're also going to talk about deriving the double angle formulas. This is section 5.3 in our textbook. This is the first of about four videos we're going to record on section 5.3. It is a very dense section. There's a lot of new identities to learn. And historically, I find that this is the section that students often struggle with at first. Um, so if you're finding this challenging, just please slow down, take some extra time, and I promise you, you will get it with extra practice. We're going to start by deriving these new identities. Um, this is the first set of new identities in the section. I think these are probably the most useful and the easiest to, to prove and generate. So you will remember from section 5.2, that we talked about the angle sum identities for sine, cosine, and tangent. And you've already seen those um, probably just a little bit ago. And they were very useful, but they weren't particularly, um, you know, helpful in, they were only helpful, we'll say, in situations where you had different angles, A and B. And honestly, most trig problems don't have different angles. They usually just have a single X or something. Um, but what is kind of sneaky is what if, we take these identities and just let A always equal B. That's something that's allowed, right? Alpha and beta were just two letters, so they could just be equal. Well then, if A is equal to B, then sine of 2x is really just the sine of x plus x. And I'm going to copy the identity from sine of A plus B to get sine... Uh, x cosine x plus cosine x sine x. Now, now that we have x is all the same, we can simplify this a little more into 2 times sine x cosine x. Uh, so you can you know, rewrite, rearrange the second one so that it groups with the first one. And that's your first identity for sine 2x. Sine 2x is equivalent to 2 sine x cosine x. Let's look at cosine of 2x. We're going to do the same trick. Uh, so I'm going to compute the cosine of x plus x using the identity for cosine of a plus b. Well, what do I get? Then I get, we'll do it in this line, cosine x cosine x minus, remember this identity has a subtraction, sine x sine x. We can simplify that a little bit more into cosine squared x minus sine squared x. So that's our identity for cosine of 2x. We'll box the sine of 2x as well. Um, I like this one in particular because remember, we already have an identity. Cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. Now we have an identity with cosine squared minus sine squared. It's also interestingly equal to something. Finally, we can do the same with the identity for tangent. We could do uh, these two and put them in fraction and simplify, but we don't have to because we already have a double angle uh, or an angle sum property for tangent. So if I compute the tangent of x plus x, that's going to give me tangent x plus tangent x over 1 minus tangent x tangent x, which will simplify to 2 tangent x over 1 minus tangent squared of x. And that's your identity for tangent. I will say at this point, uh, the tangent one is not used particularly often. And when you uh, are supposed to use it, it's a really kind of unique structure with the fractions and the tangent squared. So it's usually pretty clear when you're supposed to use it. These two, on the other hand, they kind of are very similar looking. And so it can be confusing about which to use where. And, and that's where the uh, challenge usually derives. I'm also going to throw another wrinkle into the mix. Um, I did mention, recall, that cosine squared x plus sine squared x is equal to 1 which means that cosine squared x is equal to 1 minus sine squared x, and sine squared x is equal to 1 minus cosine squared x. Why is that important? Well, 
I can use these two interesting substitutions in that new identity for cosine of 2x to create more identities for cosine of 2x. Um, the deal is with the cosine identity, I'm going to zoom in on her just for a second. With the cosine identity, uh, it's useful, but it has a cosine squared and a sine squared. And most of the time when you're simplifying a problem, your goal is to get it into one trig function or the other and not have this weird situation with both cosines and sines. So what we're going to do is create two more identities. We'll call this number one. And I'll substitute in for the sine squared first. So I would have cosine squared x minus 1 minus cosine squared x. I'm substituting in sine squared for 1 minus cosine squared. Then uh, this negative distributes to both terms, and you would get 2 cosine squared x minus 1. And that's another identity equivalent to cosine of 2x. And this one is frankly much more useful than the first one because it, it only has a, a single term. Cosine squared is a pretty nice thing. There's a lot of identities that work with cosine squared. And um, it just doesn't have a sine squared. Here's another thing we could do. Let's substitute in for the cosine squared. So identity 2 is going to say um, 1 minus sine squared x minus sine squared x. That second one doesn't change. And then we group like terms. We get 1 minus 2 sine squared x. And that is also equal to cosine of 2x. So if you're solving something with cosine of 2x, oh there, you have three choices. You can do choice, oh, I guess I'll call this choice number zero, cosine squared minus sine squared. Choice number one, two cosine squared x minus one. Or choice number two, one minus two sine squared x. Here are the three new identities uh, right here. They're also written in your book. What I would recommend right now is making yourself a little note sheet so you have those in front of you for the rest of the video. And you have those in front of you while you're doing your homework problems tonight. I certainly will be uh, finishing the rest of the video with a note sheet in front of me so that I don't have to remember all these identities. Um, but I think it, you know, the, also I do encourage you to write them down. Don't just print something out because the more you write them down, the better you will learn them and the more familiar they'll become. So there's a lot of other cool tricks you can do with these identities. Um, you can, for example, use them to find sine or cosine of an angle like 22.5 that you had no idea what to do with before. But in this video, all we're going to do is the process of verifying identities similar to what you did in section 5.1 and a little bit in 5.2. Just to recap, here are the rules. When you're verifying identities, you can only work uh, with one side at a time. You can work with the left, you can work with the right, but you can't cross the sides. Both sides operations, like multiplying by sine x, or canceling, like dividing by cosine x, are not allowed. Uh, see my video on section 5.1 for a little more on why that's true. Um, your goal in the end is to make both sides match. So they need to be equivalent in some way uh, through an organized set of steps. That's it. So with that in mind, let's look at verifying an identity. I think we're going to do four of them today, and we'll start with this the ones with sine of x and work up. Give myself some space here. All right, so I'm verifying an identity. That means that I'm not allowed to assume this is true. I'm going to draw a big line down the middle and say, hey, can't break that barrier. Now, I think I'm going to have to work with the left and the right side here, just um, from kind of experience. But the thing I see right away is a sine of 2 theta, that's sine of 2x, and I know that that's what this section is about. So I'm going to go ahead and do a substitution for the sine of 2x. So I know that this side is equivalent to 1 minus, that's just from the 1, 2 sine theta cosine theta. Okay? That's just directly substituting with the identity for sine of 2 theta. Now here, uh, I don't actually know what to do yet. So I'm going to leave this for a moment. I've substituted in the identity. But I don't really see how to break it up. It looks like maybe uh, I want to go to the other side, and I want to deal with that exponent. 
So I'm kind of just like taking each side and simplifying it a little bit until it uh, until I get stuck. And then I'm going to the other side and simplify that a little bit until I get stuck. So what do I do here? Well, this is a binomial. I'm going to have to foil it out. So uh, it's a perfect square, though. So this is going to be perfect square pattern, sine squared theta, minus 2 AB. Well, that's A, that's B. So this is cosine theta, sine theta. And then it's going to be plus cosine uh, squared theta. Right? So just the perfect square pattern. Um, you probably you might see what to do right away. If you don't see it, I'm going to rearrange this into sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta minus 2 cosine theta sine theta. Why would I do that? Well, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, as we talked about earlier, is always equal to 1. So I have 1 minus 2 cosine theta sine theta. And at this point, my work is complete because I have shown that the left and right sides are equivalent. If you did not feel like working uh, anymore with the right side, or you, you just didn't start with the right side, at this point you might also say, oh my gosh, guys, this is the identity, sine, ooh, that, sine of 2 theta, and substitute that in, and then get that this side is equal to 1 minus sine 2 theta, and then you would also be done. So uh, you, can, you can proceed in a number of ways, but as after you factor out that binomial. Here's another excuse me, interesting flavor of problem that you might see in your textbook. It'll be phrased in a number of different ways, but the idea is uh, to verify that this statement matches with this graph. And so they don't give you the identity that you're trying to solve for. You just have to use your knowledge of graphing. I really love this kind of problem because it sort of brings everything together. So let's take a second and just peek at this graph and see what we can figure out. They're telling us this viewing window is negative 2 pi to 2 pi, so that's telling us the x, and it's telling us the step. This is the step, remember? So the step is pi over 2, which means this is pi, which means this is 3 pi over 2. And it looks like a pretty ordinary sine graph, but the window goes negative 3 to 3 to 1, which means that the maximum value is at 2, and the minimum value is at negative 2. So it appears that this is a graph of y equals sine 2, nope, 2 sine x, right? It, it appears to be a sine graph with a standard period of 2 pi, but an amplitude of 2, an increased amplitude. And the question is, well, how in the world could something with a uh, no amplitude changes and a secant and a sine 2x, how could all of that create such a standard sine graph? Well, let's do the algebra. So here I don't really even have two sides. I'm just going to work with the sine 2x part. Well, I know that sine 2x, so I have sine 2x secant x, and I'm trying to manipulate this into something else. Okay? Well, sine 2x is equal to 2 sine x cosine x, still multiplied by secant x. I know that secant is 1 over cosine x. So I have 2 sine x cosine x times 1 over cosine x. I know those will reduce out. And so I can confirm that the statement sine 2x secant x is equivalent to the statement 2 sine x, which matches with the graph we were trying to verify. So that's how you'd approach a problem like that. Just make sure you're looking very carefully at the graph you're paying attention to things like amplitude and period, just in case there's a little change with the amplitude or the period. Okay, here's another identity. And this one seems a little more challenging, just immediately looking at it. I know that I do have some identities for tangent squared, right? There's the Pythagorean identity, so I may need to use that. I'm going to hold off on that and focus again on cosine 2x. This is the, you know, the theme of this section. I'm going to have to address that. If I'm going to show that something with a single x is equivalent to the other side, I'm going to have to address that x. So I know that cosine of 2x is equal to this, or it's equal to 
this, or it's equal to, it's two of those, it's equal to that. I'm going to have to substitute in here, but I don't know which thing I'm going to substitute for. And you could probably make the problem work with any of those chosen substitutions. Um, so it pays to be a little strategic. I notice that I have a 1 here, and I have a minus sign. Now, every single one of these identities has a minus sign, so I think I'm going to get that when I substitute. Um, but I, I'm starting to see that if I, since I'm dividing by cosine squared, if I plug in something with a cosine squared, that will help me achieve that 1. So I think I'm going to use the first identity substitution, at least at first, and see what happens. Oh, draw a line down the middle. I don't think I'm going to have to work with this side at all. I think it's just going to be the right-hand side, but let's see. So this right side will be, will be equivalent to cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x. Make sure you're putting those 2's up high because there is right that 2x floating around, so if you're really messy with your 2's, that could uh, lead to some confusion for you or a reader. And we wouldn't want that. So let's substitute that in. Okay, so now we have a fraction with a single denominator, which means we can break up that fraction. And that means this will be equivalent to cosine squared x, or cosine squared x minus sine squared x over cosine squared x, and that's going to be equivalent to 1 minus tangent squared of x, which was my goal. So this identity is also verified. That wasn't so bad. Um, I think the hardest part of these verifying identities is selecting which of the cosine 2x identities to choose. It just so happened in this one that it was the first one. Um, but often it, it really just depends on the problem. If you get stuck, if you hit a wall, guess what? Go back to the start and try something different. That's uh, very good as a strategy here. Okay, uh, one more problem. I'm going to do a little copy here. Okay, so we're going to verify that cotangent of x is equal to 1 plus cosine 2x over the sine of 2x. This one's going to be perhaps especially tricky because I have two double angle identities that I'm going to substitute in. Also, it's maybe tricky because the left side isn't giving me a lot to work with, so I'm only going to really be able to work with the right side uh, unless I get really creative. I think what I'm going to do first is just directly substitute in the sine 2x. I know that's 2 sine x cosine x, and not substitute the cosine 2x yet because with cos 2x, I have three choices, and again, I'm not quite sure which will be the most useful choice. So now what I'm going to do is inspect cosine 2x and think about which of these three things I might want. Here are the choices, 1, 2, or 3. I think what I want is this one right here. Why do I want that? I notice that in the original problem, I have 1 plus. And in this problem, I have minus 1. So I know that if I plug those in, that 1 is going to, poof, disappear. It's going to cancel out. And I know that I want that because the side on the left doesn't have any other constants. It's just cotangent. So I think I'm going to try that. I, I, I don't know how it, if it'll all work out, but I think that's the thing I want to try. So I'm going to go with that second identity as a substitution. So I'm going to have 1 plus 2 cosine squared x minus 1 over 2 x cosine x. I'm give myself some space here. Okay, so this is going to be the ones will reduce out. Okay, it's starting to be really clear what's about to happen. The twos will reduce out, and one of these cosines will cancel with that. And then this is equivalent to cosine x over sine x, which is equivalent to cotangent x. And that's what I was trying to show. 
So this identity is verified as well. And here it is all in one spot. So again, not so bad. All right, and that's going to be the end of this video on section 5.3. Uh, we proved some new identities for double angle, and we've used those identities to uh, help us in the process of verifying more identities. Again, verifying identities is just that single algebraic manipulation uh, that we've been doing for a little while now. Please tune in for the next video, though, because the uh, double angle identities are actually really useful for physical calculations, too, finding the sines, cosines, and tangents of actual angles, and it can prove to be even a little bit trickier than verifying identities itself. So please stick around, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.